Lauren is the Clean Energy Communities Coordinator for the Northern Territory for Original Power. She has close to two decades experience working in community development and organising capacities with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the NT and Queensland to implement self-determined solutions to complex community needs. She has led programs and teams of people in the design, implementation and assessment of community-driven projects and has experience delivering community energy planning scenarios, standalone and grid-connected solar and battery storage projects and renewable energy law and policy reform to ensure that First Nations people play a leading role in the clean energy transition. So thanks very much, Lauren. It'd be great to hear more. Great. Thanks very much, Marg, and, uh, and Anne and everyone from the Desert Song Festival. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for having Original Power on the First Nations Clean Energy Network. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of the Aranda people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Uh, I also just want to say how blown away I was by the students from Olsh. That was so such an uplifting thing to hear the articulation of climate justice and the really urgent or urgent tasks we have ahead of us here for everyone, but coming from such young people and hearing, you know, very clear solutions coming through in terms of renewable energy and that sort of thing, it's incredibly heartening to hear that that message is really getting through and, and leadership is coming from young people. So thanks very much for, for opening that presentation today. Um, I work with Winona, the, the previous presenter here, um, and we are working to try and uh, implement some of those solutions to the climate crisis that we're currently facing. Uh, the organisation uh, that I work for is Original Power. We're quite a small Aboriginal-led um, community development organisation. We specialise in offering strategic support to communities um, where that invitation has been um, offered uh, to, to basically provide resourcing, on-ground support, um, and work towards self-determination for some very complex community development um, challenges ahead of us. So I work here in the Northern Territory on the Clean Energy Communities Project, uh, which is aiming to break through some of the structural barriers that we're facing that are currently preventing First Nations people from participating in and benefiting from the clean energy transition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those projects today and hopefully that can spark some conversation about how we actually implement the solutions because we all know what they are, but when we get down to the nitty gritty of how we do it, that's when we start facing the difficult challenges. So we've been learning a lot as we as we work through this. So this is our program, the Clean Energy Communities Project. We work with communities across the Northern Territory who are interested in developing their own clean energy projects. Um, we also offer support to communities that are dealing with large scale renewable energy proposals um, and work to change laws and policies that mean that First Nations people who are uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change here in Northern Australia can choose development that is clean, that is appropriate and that meets the immediate needs of those communities. So the projects that we do are First Nations designed and driven projects. The policy that comes forward from those projects is, is learned. Uh, those solutions are learned out of the projects as we build them in community. Um, and we look for community ownership and governance models that can make sure that people are, communities are genuinely driving that change. What we're trying to do is overcome the structural barriers that are currently preventing more uptake of renewable energy here in the Northern Territory. Um, I won't go into all of them because there are a lot, but really what we're all interested in is not just a fast transition to clean energy. As Winona said, in, in Australia, we're experiencing one of the fastest uptakes of renewable energy of anywhere across the globe, but Indigenous people are missing out on that transition and in many places in the Northern Territory are actually locked out of even simple opportunities like rooftop solar. So not just a fast transition, we want to make sure it's a fair, fair transition as well and the wealth and the opportunities that are created in the renewable energy transition are transferred to custodians and landowners um, where these projects will be built. So I want to talk a little bit about the link between climate change and extreme heat that we're experiencing here in Central Australia um, and energy insecurity. Just if I can see my notes there. Uh, some research that Winona also touched on coming out of the 2018-2019 extremely hot periods that we're experiencing here in Central Australia. Many people are probably still scarred from those very long heat waves that we had here um, that saw huge ecological die-off across Central Australia, huge changes to, um, to our ecosystems um, and a normalisation of um, less predictable rainfall patterns um, uh, and other, and other uh, extreme weather events. 
Um, so those are the types of things where that trend of climate change here in Central Australia is continuing to trend upwards in terms of extreme heat, breaking record heat levels and unpredictable rainfall. Um, what that does, of course, to people living in poorly designed homes, especially out bush, um, but also in town camps, is it means people need to use more energy to deal with extreme temperatures. So your energy consumption goes up, the cost of paying the electricity bills goes up, and people are being disconnected more and more frequently. And what we were hearing out of that period in 2018, 2019, was that the number of people in remote communities and town camps were experiencing electricity disconnection so frequently that their homes are almost unlivable. And that sparked a lot of research that for the first time meant we could look at data coming out of Power and Water Corporation here in the Northern Territory and learn that um, on average, Indigenous customers using the prepaid metering system to ac access electricity were being disconnected from power every four days on average, sometimes for a period of eight hours or more. As Winona said, fridges go off, medicines are not stored safely. Uh, you lose any any ability to cool your home or even have water to wash bedding and and, um, and people. So the basic functions of a healthy home are completely denied to people who can't afford basic access to electricity. That's why it's really urgent. And that's why climate change um, is driving energy insecurity across Central Australia. You can see there in the background, if you've been through Tennant Creek, you'd recognise the clock tower there, which I'm not sure is much of a tourist attraction, but it does tell you what the temperature is in Tennant Creek on any given day. And um, at the time we were there looking at solar options for Tennant Creek, it was regularly 47, 48 degrees on that clock tower there. Um, and people are in homes that have no insulation whatsoever and are frequently disconnected from power. Uh, so yeah, so the, the research that I wanted to talk about looking at energy insecurity basically gave us for the first time a very clear insight into how big a challenge this is for the Northern Territory and particularly the prepaid metering system and how that interacts to keep people in energy insecurity. So the work that Original Power is doing is aiming to find a way that people on prepaid metering, which affects over 10,000 homes here in the Northern Territory, mostly remote community homes, but also across um, urban centres in town camps and social housing. Um, those 10,000 homes are currently denied access to connecting rooftop solar. So you've seen the huge uptake in rooftop solar right around Australia, even in places like Darwin and Alice Springs. If you're an Indigenous prepaid meter customer in an outbush, you currently can't connect rooftop solar and have the benefits of that. The reason being our retailer, electricity retailer and our utility was unsure whether you could technically connect a prepaid meter to the rooftop solar. So it was a straight up no if you went for a connection, even if you could afford the rooftop solar to begin with. So that was what we were facing. So we worked with uh, Waramungu Elder in Tennant Creek, Norman Frank, his wife Serena and their family. They had three adult families living under one roof in a, in a single dwelling in Tennant Creek. They were using a, a, a high level of electricity in their home, um, trying to sustain those three families under one roof because of the overcrowding issues. Um, and Norm put his hand up to be a test case to say, I think solar can work with the prepaid meters and I think this is the way that we can help our people. So last year we worked with Norman Frank and his family there and we connected 6.6 .6 kilowatts of solar to the rooftop of his home. We worked with the meter manufacturer with the prepaid meters to connect solar through there. There wasn't any issues, wasn't any technical issues as the utility had been saying for many, many years. And then we, we fought for about six months um, in the media telling Norm's story about how beneficial having access to this solar would be to reduce the disconnections and the electricity costs in his home. Um, and uh, earlier this year, we got approval to finally connect that rooftop solar. It's been, <laughs> doesn't sound like much, one house connected to rooftop solar, but as Norm said at the time, this will really be, it'll open the floodgates for Indigenous families to be able to access the benefits of rooftop solar as people should have always been able to. So that was a really heartening experience. And since that time, Norm's gone from 26 disconnections throughout the year um, to no connection, no disconnections in his home, He's constantly connected to power and he has a buffer of credit on his prepaid meter. So it is pretty simple. The solutions are sitting right there in front of us. If only we'll have the courage to, to work with communities to find and implement the solutions. So, um, so what we're trying to do now is not just leave it at Norm's house and, you know, his neighbours are all asking how they can get solar. So we're looking at how we can upscale that to whole of community solutions that also work with the prepaid metering system. So there's a couple of pictures of um, 
uh, some of the local fellas in Tennant Creek helping Norm install the solar on his rooftop there. And there's the finished product, the only house in a town camp with solar power and a prepaid meter. Um, so the next project we're working on is in Marlinger, which some of you might know as Newcastle Waters, right next to the big cattle station there um, near the community of Elliott, about 600, 700 kilometres up the Stewart Highway. Marlinger community sits right in the middle of the Beedaloo gas basin, the basin that the federal government is talking about exploiting and opening up as a new fossil fuel reserve. This community has been fighting that proposal for a long, long time, around 10 years now. Um, it's created some division in the community, a lot of upset, but it's also, you know, given people a lot of experience in, um, in speaking up for their country and speaking up for the types of development they want. So a few years ago, we were invited in to work with the community of Marlinger on an energy transition um, process. The community wanted to go solar. They wanted to demonstrate to the government that they don't want to go with the gas giants and, and lose out. They don't believe there's jobs in those projects that are being talked about and they don't believe it's the way to go to look after climate or their community. Marlinger um, residents are saying very clearly they're seeing less rainfall, extreme temperatures, um, and it's becoming hotter and harder to live in their community and opening up a new gas basin right next door is not going to be the solution. So we started working with Marlinger a few years ago and sat down and started planning what the future of Marlinger would look like. There's only 18 homes. It's quite a small community. We thought we'd better not bite off more than we can chew here because we don't know if this has been done before. Um, but we'll sit down with you and plan to solar power and have battery storage available for all of those 18 homes there. Now, where we're at at the moment, after lots of engagement with the utility and the retailer, um, working with industry partners to get aspects of that solar project donated, gifted, training packages drawn up so the community could really benefit from installing this and, and operating it themselves. We're at the point where we're very close to having a connection agreement with Power and Water Corporation, which would mean that Marlinger community becomes the first um, community-owned energy project in the Northern Territory to be connected to a government-owned power network, so to be connected into the diesel gas network in Elliott. The community still wanted to have that grid backup as security rather than forking out the money for a completely standalone system, completely understandable, but then it meant we had to get around the prepaid metering system as well. So what we're proposing for Marlinger is it's a 100 kilowatt solar array that will produce um, up to 700 kilowatts of power every day. They've also got battery storage. We're going to use the prepaid metering system to send that power as financial credit as a dollar figure amount to each household as a daily energy budget. So every day the resident walks out, checks their meter, instead of it being in deficit, they might be up $20 because they've produced that every single day. That's shared equitably amongst the community. So it's one way that we're finding to use what was quite a discriminatory and limiting um, uh, system, the prepaid metering, to actually benefit the community and distribute their own produced power. So if you're ever talking to anyone from Power and Water, please mention Marlinger and that you'd love to see more of these projects get approval because really that's the only thing that's holding this project up at the moment is a very slow process um, of getting those sorts of approvals. But we hope to be in construction by the end of this year if we can get that approval from Power and Water. So, um, so yeah, incredibly proud of the work that the community of Marlinger has done, showing leadership, doing the research and development and actually implementing these solutions. Going to the next... Next size again, Borolula and the Gulf of Carpentaria um, is another community that we're working with, incredibly staunch community there who has dealt for a long time with the impacts of extractive mining from Glencore's MacArthur River mine. A lot of environmental impacts, a lot of climate impacts being seen in the Gulf region with mangrove die-off, um, water contamination. There's a long history of people being very wary of, of um, extractive industries in that region. That's another reason why we chose to work with Borolula community who are again on the edges of new fossil fuel development. They wanted to say no and to offer an alternative to government. So for the last couple of years, we've been working on a feasibility study with the Borolula community to develop up a 2.4 megawatt solar farm and power the homelands surrounding Borolula community. Um, the community are heavily engaged in this. There are a lot of people working on this project. Um, this is a meeting of the Mabungi Aboriginal Resource Corporation endorsing this project recently and this is another one that we'll be taking to government soon and saying we think we can save you 1.4 million dollars every year on diesel savings 
if you allow this project to go forward. So there's actually a lot in it for people in the Northern Territory who are heavily subsidising remote power generation at the moment. If we can start to get more of these solar projects happening across the bush, we can start to drive down the subsidies that are needed and see these communities start to alleviate energy insecurity um, and start to drive that economic wellbeing that will come from those projects. These are some of the guys working on the project here, looking at the old bushlight systems. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying here are some of the key challenges. And I think when we talk about the solutions to climate change, we need to be talking about what sort of um, projects we want to see. Do we want to see just the big sun cable projects, the big projects that are pushed by companies, or do we actually want to see clean energy technology and innovation being used to alleviate our most pressing challenges? And I think that's what most Northern Territorians would like to see. Um, and that's that's the type of work that we're doing with communities right now. So I just want to give people some hope and inspiration that these projects are underway. Uh, there are people working on them and we'd love people to come and join us in that work because the more, more people that are thinking about these sorts of solutions, the more projects we can get up and running. And then we really do have a base of um, proof of concept that is very different to the current model of energy development that we have at the moment, it's driving the climate crisis. Um, so yeah, so we can talk a lot about what those other solutions are, but I'm not sure that we need to in this context. I might just leave you with a very short film from Marlinger Community, which is uh, talking about the first stage of their community energy tra um, transition process, which is uh, the community basically solar powering and adding batteries to a community centre there. Um, prior to that, the community couldn't afford power cards to have any sort of activities outside of the home. People were struggling just to keep the lights and power on in their own home. So after we did this project, all built with community labour, uh, there was a huge big celebration there. Bands came and played, the whole community came out. The kids learned about solar power and the opportunities that were there at Newcastle Waters School. Um, and since then, that community centre has offered a, a refuge for people uh, isolating due to COVID. Um, whereas previously there was nowhere. Um, it's offered support for families coming and visiting the community for funeral and other business. And it's also a host of kids' activities, arts and culture, and really given a space for community to come together and plan more of these sorts of community development activities. So, um, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up there and just click this video somehow, or maybe you'll help me. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Good morning, guys. You are headed about 25 k's north of Elliot near um, Newcastle Waters Station. It's a homeland. I think with what's happening with the community centre and having that solar project, that's something that the community hasn't had in a long time. And the renovation, of course, that's a really good step towards making and creating a space for the community. All the community mob, they're really excited that they're really proud of themselves, what is happening here for the for this community with this solar panel and running the community center with this power from the sun. Paying paying power card is probably about fifty dollar or hundred dollar a week, you know. And it's just too too much for, for family to handle that and some of them, you know, can't afford that. So it's very, very helpful in that in that way. The biggest issue is our power outage and there's the main power here where in this community there was a nest there but it was during the wet season and because of the water that came up and we didn't have any power and no one couldn't get across so we got stuck here on this side of the river so there wasn't any power and we had to wait for the boys from Channel Creek or Catherine to come you know. All of that from the um, mining gas and I think it's just it's we're not benefiting from it at all that you know it doesn't come back into the community in any way and solar i think is the future for our communities because it's sustainable it doesn't cause harm to the environment we're educating children about solar like that thing in a fix and and how it works by sun it's really, really exciting about tonight because once the solo panel is finished, then we're going to have the band, we're going to have the barbecue, and even the kids will be singing, performing their song here in language. I'd like to see more solo panels in Malinja in the future. Cheaper, cleaner, and more jobs for the local people around Malinja. Everyone's very excited. Even even myself and 
we can't wait for this fellow to light up and, and for the future for our young young children and even ourselves. So now it's going to be a place where everyone can sort of come together and create music and art and, you know, like my hope is for it to become a healing center. I mean, you know, for a lot of things to happen under it. This year where we're putting the solar system in, it just main basis for our cultural stuff, like we'll have a band and the kids can come where they can have their play group. The community like to see more of them house with solo in their home, you know, in the house. Hopefully in the near future, we'll, we'll have solo in every house for the future.